Yeah, let's start the second lecture for today. So for today, we'll be talking about sequencing uh, for genome analysis. So the agenda for today, we'll discuss three topics. The first one, what is actually genome analysis? And last week, we explained a lot of things about genome analysis and what is the problem, why we are not able to read the full genome as is. And then we will discuss what is intelligent genome analysis. So uh, there's really a huge need to accelerate genome analysis and not only acceleration, but also improving the privacy, the uh, throughput of it, the energy efficiency and so on. So all of these factors together, we call them intelligent genome analysis. So when we call intelligent genome analysis, not really just fast analysis, but rather uh, many other things that we need to account for. And uh, toward the end, we'll explain how we analyze the genome. So let's start with genome analysis. So when you analyze something, the purpose of computing or analysis is always to gain insight. We, are, we don't care about the raw numbers. So in raw numbers, um, uh, we call them a data, right? but you cannot call them information until you get insights. And this is what we are trying to do with genome analysis. We don't care about the content of your DNA, but rather about the genes, the phenotypes, and uh, the genotypes of your DNA. What are the things that might cause a problem, for example? We don't really care about the full sequence of your DNA, whether it's ACGT or GCT, as long as we know what are the locations in your DNA and what is the content of your DNA at these locations. And then we can observe what are the differences that might cause a problem. Again, this problem might not be important to you because they may not cause a disease for you, but might uh, cause a disease to your generation. So the next generation might hold these differences and then they might have disease in the future. So even if you have these differences in your DNA, might not be problematic for you. And again, all these differences might not be a disease, it might be just skin color or eye color and so on. So all these differences are important to understand, but they might not be risky or problematic. This is exactly the same as you see in this picture. For example, you see all these people, they are really different. You can see the body shape, the mass, the hair color, eye color, skin color, the way, the, uh, the high, and so on. So all of these factors make us different. And what makes us different is basically our DNA or our genetic material. So when you want to analyze a genome, we want to study or identify or measure, uh, compare genomic features and understand them at the very low level, which is the DNA. And then we can move one step further to RNA, and then to the protein, and then understand the disease. Of course, if you compare two genomes together, uh, you may observe different differences. But again, these differences uh, can be significant or insignificant. That is to say, even if you find these differences, you cannot conclude with a very strong confidence that this might cause a disease, and unless you do something which we call population scale study that I'm going to explain next. Now, the first step to do genome analysis is to purchase one of these kits. Uh, you can get it from pharmacy, from online, where you do the swab yourself at home, exactly as you do COVID-19 test, for example. You just take a swab, you follow the instructions and post it back to the company. Now the company will observe your chromosomes and try to uh, study them or investigate them in details. So as you know, the chromosomes are pairs and one, one version of this pair coming from the mother and another one coming from the father. And this is what makes us or what makes the DNA. Okay, so now about the population scale analysis. So we have a bunch of individuals here, 16 individual. Each individual has his own DNA. This is a just small portion of the DNA. And now we know that all of them have blood pressure. Some of them have a healthy blood pressure. Some of them have unhealthy blood pressure. Now for the unhealthy ones, 
which is very high blood pressure. You can observe it in the first half of these uh, individuals. The second half of these individuals, you have very low uh, or healthy blood pressure, or which is low. And your goal as a computer scientist, now you have a text, so you can run algorithm to correlate the differences over here with the blood pressure information. So as you are all smart people, you are trying to um, uh, leverage or infer uh, what makes this blood pressure disease. So you can see here, whenever it's G in the SNP2 or the second location, sometimes we have high blood pressure, sometimes very low, as you can see here down in the bottom. So apparently this SNAP2 has nothing to do with blood pressure. But if you check SNAP1, you will see whenever you have C at that location, you always have high blood pressure. But when you have T, you always have low blood pressure. And this is what we do, but this is easy to perform since it's really single difference. Now imagine about really complex differences, which is uh, what we will see in the next few slides. Now. When we have single variation or multiple variations, we do a study called genome-wide association. Uh, and this in, uh, study, we have two group of people. One of them should really be healthy from that disease. The other one should not be healthy from that disease. And we call one as control, the other as cases. And then we observe their genomic material or the DNA. And then we try to compare it using this, what we call Manhattan plot. And you can guess why we call it that name since all these uh, towers over there. In the x-axis, we have all the chromosomes at specific location. So every uh, dot over there represent the location in the x-axis. In the y-axis, we have the significance, which is the negative log uh, uh, of uh, the uh, frequency. And if the frequency in certain SNAP or genomic variation exceed a threshold, which we set it here in this dashed line, then we said this SNAP is significant. Why significant? Because it happened frequently with the disease group. So uh, we can correlate these to the each disease uh, we have in the study. You can study multiple diseases, you can study single disease and so on. Sometimes it's easy to infer what are the variations, sometimes really complex, such as in uh, autism and cancer, we don't have specific location in the genome. Uh, somehow, sometimes it's random, sometimes it's fixed pattern. So we don't know for some disease what are really the causes. Once we know the causes, it's kind of straightforward to develop a drug for these or try to edit the gene you have so that uh, you don't make this variation your DNA significant or it will not be translated into RNA or protein so that they cause disease or they cause problem. Uh, since the, now we are able to read more DNAs so we can do more studies to the population, Again, uh, comparing individual to individual might not give you uh, insights or results as if you are comparing group to group of people, because that will increase the confidence that these differences are really important and they are the cause for such a problem in your DNA. And for that, we have now a huge number of studies so that they can compare a group of people to a group of people and then try to infer these differences. And this is a new study called transcriptome-wide association study. Rather than just observing the DNA, we observe more information next to the DNA, and then we compare all this information together uh, between the two group of people so that we have a really high confidence about these differences. Now, this is the thing in more details about the blood pressure I was explaining. This is for different disease, which is hepatitis C, but it's exactly the same idea. Now, this is open access database. If you go to this link, exactly, you will see some uh, information similar to this. It, it tell you that the chromosome number 19 in your DNA at this location, uh, if you have a T coming from the mother, a T coming from the father, then 20% of such patients responded to treatment. 
So very low probability to get a better uh, after getting a treatment. However, if you have a C from the mother and C from the father in this chromosome, in this location, then your probability uh, will be much higher than uh, the, the, the previous case, TT. So in this, what we call personalized medicine. So once you go to the hospital, it will be very beneficial to do the DNA test and then observe these differences. And based on this, you can search these open access databases and see uh, whether you'll get better for this disease or the, another disease and so on. Of course, that require, or these kind of databases are based on a uh, historical record of previous patients. So if there's a new disease, uh, it will be hard to find some evidence about personalized medicine. But normally personalized medicine is very beneficial as we will see in these studies. So these real studies apply to real patients in real hospitals. And they observe that whenever you have critically sick infants who do normally survive in a few days, if they got the medication, if not, they normally die quickly. So they observe that if they do whole genome sequencing, which can be in two options, either you pay a lot, then you can do the analysis very fast in two days, or you want to pay moderate rate, then in five days, you can get the results of this analysis. Now, once they do whole genome sequencing for these uh, elephants or babies, uh, they observe that they can avoid morbidity, reduce hospital stay, and the inpatient cost. And the reduction really significant. Think about uh, reducing your bill by about 70% or reducing the cost by about $100,000 to $2 million. You know that whenever you deal with babies, the cost of inpatients is really high because all this equipment, uh, the, uh, the ICU rooms, the, the uh, intensive care, that they should take uh, care of these babies. And normally the, the probability to survive is really low, especially if they are critically sick. So think about doing all these studies for whoever get admitted to hospital. And this is what UK is doing. They are really doing great job since a couple of years. From 2019, they start to do whole genome sequencing for, who, for whoever get admitted to a hospital especially the, the babies or the critically sick children. They directly do whole genome sequencing and then try to check what, what, what is the right treatment to be given to these babies. All right, so we've been talking about SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphism, that is single variation or single difference in your DNA. But if you think about only single differences, that will be kind of easy, fun to play with. But if we move on with more disease, you will observe that it's really more complex than single difference. For example, in autism, we have a deletion of 500,000 character uh, from the DNA of the patient. And they observe this for, for whoever having autism. Uh, same thing with obesity and the opposite disease, which is underweight. So you have a deletion of 500,000 characters in obesity, but in underweight, you have a duplication in the same chromosome, which is a chromosome 16. And here in the second line in each of these diseases, you can see the reference or the paper who do this analysis. This is really um, uh, challenging. It's very difficult to observe single difference or to find these differences since they are really huge. So if you are talking about 500,000 deleted character from, from your DNA, then if you are doing kind of alignment or uh, sequence alignment or base alignment, we call it, try to find these differences, then you need to set a lot of threshold very high so that you can observe these or try to find intelligent way to detect these deleted characters. So if you are interested in finding these, what we call them structure, structural variation. Structural variation mean any uh, variation that is, could be insertion or deletion or substitution that is larger than 50 character. So if you have a del deletion more than 50, then we call it structural variation. And in this paper, uh, you'll see a lot of a method, a lot of algorithms and types of structural variation uh, so you can get uh, an, a good introduction to this topic.
Uh, if you, we have questions on YouTube, I can take them anytime. So please share it with me. Uh, if we have questions here in the classroom, please directly, you can enable your mic and speak up. Now, what is intelligent genome analysis? Okay, so the first thing, which is really obvious, is to have very fast genome analysis, which is real-time analysis. If I go to the hospital and I'm critically sick, I expect to get treatment or medication very fast, in, within the first hour or very first few hours. And that is bandwidth. Now, using intelligent architecture, why we need architectures or hardware for that? Uh, so when we having specialized hardware to do the analysis, you know that we will have less data movement, we will have less energy requirement, and we'll have less delay. And that is a specialization. So uh, when you do always specialization, you gain uh, benefits in terms of energy, latency, maybe the cost, maybe the area, maybe the portability of the equipment used for analysis and so on, which is way better than having general purpose computer for the analysis. And this is also something very special about the data that we are dealing with. Uh, if you are dealing about like machine learning or face, face detection and so on, you may not want to worry about what you are detecting, but here in DNA, it's very valuable. Why is that? Your DNA representing your mother, your father, your kids, your uh, grandchild, and so on. So it's, it's real, it's not about only you, but about the other generations who are coming or who they already passed. So once you know your DNA, you can infer a lot of things about the disease that um, um, your sibling might have because they already have a copy from mother, a copy from father, and you already have that. Of course, there are some differences between kids that happening uh, during uh, uh, the de novo uh, differences when the cell get divided, for example. But all these differences with very low probability. So you have 99.9% .9 similarity with uh, your close relatives. And that uh, opened a lot of concerns about the privacy. That's why we have uh, three projects on uh, uh, preserving the privacy of uh, individuals. And then the population scale. So we've been talking about in the first one, which is the bandwidth, or we want to have very fast genome analysis. But how fast we should be able to do the analysis? Is one hour enough? Is 10 minutes enough? Is one minute enough? So that is for individual. Now, when we talk about population or very large hospital, for example, Zurich Hospital, so in the hospital, how many patients need the analysis per day or per hour? And then we talk about scalability. So how scalable are you able to do genome analysis? If you can do one analysis in one hour, how many analyses you can do in one day? If 24, hour, 24 analyses you can do in one day, is that enough? How many analyses you can do in parallel? And again, that will push the limit or push the need for having parallelism or scalability. Now, of course, there are a lot of methods that we call them heuristic because sacrifice accuracy of the analysis. So they, they, sacrifice, they sacrifice the accuracy to gain more speed up. So they want to increase the performance of the analysis by having very fast analysis, but they might sometimes give you wrong results. They tell you there is insertion here, but in fact, it's deletion or they give you something not optimal. And we don't want that. We don't want to favor that because it might bias the entire analysis. All right, does intelligent genome analysis really matter? Why we should care? Uh, I could wait three hours to get the analysis. I could wait two days to get the analysis. It's not a big deal. So ultimately we should have something really as in this movie or uh, what envisioned in these two movies. So the first one, Gattaca in 1997, and Tomorrowland in 2015. How many of you watch these two movies or any of these movies? Okay, yeah, uh, we got one hand. Okay, cool. Yeah, in these two movies, you can see here the screenshot over there. So they can use their DNA as um, a unique identifier to individuals. 
So this unique ID, uh, for example, you want to access very important building or uh, highly secured building, then you can use your DNA. For example, you have small equipment with a small needle that will go to your finger and get just a small amount of blood, do the DNA analysis in a matter of uh, milliseconds or so, and then identify you based on your DNA sequence, which is unique to you. Uh, although there are 99.9 .9 similarity between individuals, but there are also a significant amount of differences, especially when we talk about very long DNA as in a human, we have 3 billion character. So the 0.1% difference is real significant. So you want to do this really in a matter of few milliseconds. You don't want people to get stuck outside until they get their analysis so that they can gain access to this building. And this is only one example of this. Uh, think about critically uh, sick elephant, for example, and so on. You can um, just leave it to your imagination to see the needs for very fast genome analysis. Okay, so when we talk about hardware, what is the right hardware to use so that you can have a specialized analysis? So this is what we call a sequencer that provides you the reads or pieces of your DNA. And then whether you want to store it in storage or SSD, and then move it to the main memory and then find specialized cores, FPGAs, or GPUs, or even heterogeneous processors where you have SIMD cores and so on? Or do you want to do the analysis inside the sequencer itself? You don't want to move a huge amount of data to another general purpose computer. Or you want to do the analysis inside the storage, for example, or inside the memory, inside the caches. Uh, all of these are possible places to do the analysis. We have uh, interesting projects in this uh, course where try to tackle different part of the compute system. And we also will see a lecture on uh, processing in memory, processing in storage, and processing near the sequencer. Uh, so you can get more insights about uh, the possible ways you can do the processing for genomic data. Ultimately, we would like to have something like this. This is a real sequencing machine, and this is a real iPhone. So if they are attached together, you can do the analysis really in portable fashion. So you do the, the sequencing here, you get the data, you do the analysis inside the phone or the mobile device. So you can get the results as is very fast. You don't really need multiple equipment or cloud computing to do the analysis. And this will be very helpful in remote areas where you don't have access to the internet, as in Ebola. It was in, in Africa. Most of the countries in Africa, they don't have good internet or they don't have at all facilities to do the analysis. So having these devices distributed over there will be very helpful. And here's one of our papers talking about the methods that can breach your privacy, uh, identifying you based on your DNA record and some social media uh, accesses. For example, if I observe your picture, I can know your hair color. And from your hair color, I can infer the genomic variation in your DNA, even if it is anonymized. And then do some um, correlation between publicly available data on online and the uh, open source databases where I can get the full DNA or I can get snipped of your DNA. For example, in OpenSNP, uh, I can know that at this location, there is high probability that people in this population have C in that location. Then I can correlate all this information together to identify you and then identify the family tree. So we discuss all these methods in, in this paper. And this is a recent, uh, this is the paper itself, actually. Can, we, can you really anonymize the donors of genomic data? So that's why uh, commercialization for these products start to consider privacy preserving tests. So here they promise you that they will observe your DNA uh, or the privacy of your DNA, uh, even if you are sending the full sample to the company. Uh, of course, um, uh, I cannot comment on this. We really need to have a third party analysis or um, unbiased analysis to uh, investigate this. These are the port portable devices that we have during Ebola time. Uh, you can see the sequencer attached through USB cable to the laptop where you do the sequencing and the analysis together in one machine. 
then this is very easy to distribute as machines uh, throughout remote areas where we don't have access to resources. Also during uh, COVID-19, we have this work that showed that you can use uh, large uh, or high throughput devices, sequencing devices to do massive scale up analysis for COVID-19. So again, scalability is very important, especially when you talk about the disease that affect the entire population. You want to do the analysis every day during every flight for all passengers uh, in the same time. You don't want to wait two days, three days to get the results. And that is will be very important for public health. For, for example, when you have crowded places during celebration, during parties, or during crowded places such as Hauptbahnhof or city centers. So you have a large number of people. If there is a virus uh, infecting these people in these places, then think about the, the public uh, or how strong these people will be or what is the business or economy will be affected uh, by having like 50% of your employees just uh, absent because they have certain diseases. This is really very risky, very important. And that's why government normally do regular checkup in train stations. And this is one of the studies that do massive scale study for all New York uh, subway stations. And they observe about uh, 1,500 samples collected from um, the ticket machines, from the, the door handles and all these stuff in the train stations. And then they do the analysis uh, using genome analysis method. They find 50% of the species or the livings in these samples are bacteria. Some of them are useful. And another 50% of the things they found in these samples are unknown. We don't know them uh, in advance. We don't have information whether these bacteria, viruses, and so on. However, what is interesting is to find something risky. This is another study uh, collected from 60 cities, uh, including Zurich. And this is a very recent study. It's really huge, targeting 60 cities around the world, collecting about 5,000 samples. So what they find in the New York station is a bacteria called Yersinia pistis. And this uh, bacteria can cause a death. So finding something in New York, which is very crowded subways normally, it's really a deadly thing. And you need to take action very immediately. And for you who doesn't know Yersinia pistis, it's a very risky one. And we already observe it in Europe in the 14th century. And it was killing more than one third of the population in that time. So that is a very huge uh, observation to find in New York. And during that time, it raised a lot of attention in the news media. They were going to uh, close all these stations and try to sanitize them and so on. However, when they do the traditional methods, they found this is a false positive or uh, false positive. So the, the tool tell them that this bacteria exists in the sample, but it was not there. So that's what we call false positive. And then uh, people start saying this is a failure of bioinformatics. We really don't want an algorithm to do the analysis for us. We want the traditional lab method to do the analysis. However, I don't think this is a failure of bioinformatics. It's just a failure of the tool was used for the analysis. Because these days we have really uh, way more advanced tools than what we have uh, before. And uh, if we use them during that time, we would not get the same results as what we got. So this raised the importance of having accurate tool rather than just focusing on the speed up. So we don't want really to have very fast tool only, but also fast and accurate tool. And there is a critical need for a fast and accurate genome analysis in general, regardless whether you are analyzing a bacteria or a disease or whatever the purpose, normally the accuracy is an important factor. Now the question is still open to us, how and where to enable fast, accurate, cheap, privacy preserving, exabyte scale analysis of genomic data. In Safari Research Group, we are targeting different places to do the analysis. All of them are specialized. And sometimes we care about general purpose computer so that we develop algorithm for CPUs so that people can investigate them and use them easily. But also we focus on developing hardware architectures using FPGAs, GPUs, processing in memory, processing near data, and processing in storage. Now, how do the, how we do the analysis? 
we got the genomic material. We tried to get the full sequence of your DNA. And we know that there is no machine that can give you the full sequence of your DNA, but rather they give you sequences or segments or fragments of your DNA. Now, why is that? The first uh, reason is the library preparation. So normally when you collect the sample in this tube and you send it to the lab, they take about uh, six hours to 24 hours to prepare the library or to prepare your sample. They don't do sequencing yet. They just prepare it. They use certain protocols. Uh, during these protocols, most of the sequencing machine or sequencing uh, techniques require to fragment your DNA. So they put it in a machine that can uh, steer it very quickly, or they can use ultrasonic uh, waves to break down your DNA. Now, why is that is needed? There are a lot of reasons discussed in these two papers, so I recommend you to read them. But in short, the chemical materials they use in this um, uh, library preparation or in, during the sequencing, they have a lifetime. And this lifetime uh, can uh, finish very quickly after reading a few, uh, um, few number of your bases. So using these enzymes uh, for the sequencing that we are going to explain next, uh, has a lifetime which is very, normally very short and can be limited to up to 100,000 characters or a million character at most, for example. Uh, so if you're interested in this, uh, I recommend these two papers to uh, read them and uh, see what are the limiting factor, why we are getting pieces of our DNA uh, rather than our full DNA. So now we agree, all of us, that we got uh, pieces of our DNA rather than the full sequence of DNA. And that is, uh, can be done in 44 hours, up to 44 hours, can be less, depends on the application and the throughput, how many of these pieces you wanna get. And the cost normally within $1,000 per sample. Of course, this is different based on the machine and the throughput uh, and uh, the technology that you want to use for sequencing. We have a large number of uh, machines, the really different machines that can uh, give you insights or can be with different applications. For example, you can process multiple samples in these devices, normally 24 or 48. And here you can process only single sample with very low throughput. Uh, in, in NovaSeq here, the highest throughput you can get over all other sequencing machines per sample because you can get a lot of reads in uh, 44 hours or two days and so on. So this is fridge size machine, very huge one. This is a smaller one and this is handheld as you can see. Now we have a lot of characteristics. I'm going, uh, the, the slides are already online so you can have an idea about this. Of course, the cost varies from country to country and so on, but these are the numbers if you're interested in knowing more details. This is the same from another company. Now we have two companies, uh, ONT, Oxford Nanopore, and Olomina. Oxford Nanopore will give you very long pieces of your DNA, and this company will give you very short pieces, but with high throughput and low price. So if we uh, consider Olomina to do the sequencing, normally they have uh, a flow cell that have a glass surface, and this glass surface you attach the DNA segment that you get after library preparation. So in library preparation, you break up your DNA into pieces or you fragment it using some methods. And then each piece of your DNA, you add the primers to attach it to this surface. So here the primer will be located. And then you have this DNA segment, and then you start the sequencing. How the sequences start? So we know that A bind always with T. A is adenine. T is thymine because they have two hydrogen bonds in the last orbit, so they can bind together all this. The same thing with the guanine and cytosine. They have three hydrogen bonds, so they always bind together. And for that, we leverage this information to do the sequencing. For example, I, we normally add T, thymine, to the surface. And if the first character or the first base in this DNA fragment is A, then there is going to be a chemical reaction because the T will bind with the A. And then you have a CMOS camera. You can observe the chemical reaction based on this. If a chemical reaction happening, 
then there is a light emitted from there, and then you can capture that with the camera. And you can repeat this with the four molecules. So you add the T, if it doesn't work, you add A, you add C, and you add G. And every time you add a molecule, you take a picture of the glass surface. Now you don't do this per DNA fragment, but you do this with all DNA fragments coming from your library or from the sample. So all of them will be uh, uh, attached to the glass surface. And then you add T to all of them. And then you wash the surface. You add the A, then you wash it. You add the C, wash it. You add the G, wash it. And you take four picture in every uh, sequencing cycle. Now you repeat this once you finish from the A, it's already binded. So once you add another chemical molecule, it won't react again because it's already binded, it's already stable. Now you add another molecule and you observe the second base and you move, okay? So you keep repeating that until you complete the sequencing for all these fragments. And uh, once you capture the picture, you got a picture of the entire glass surface. So you will see dots everywhere. For example, if there's a light coming from this point, you'll see it in the picture, light here, here, here. And then we use what we call base calling step. In this base calling step, we convert the picture into ACGT based on the information given there. I know what the molecule I added. If I add T, then directly I write A in the output for these corresponding fragments. This is how the, the, the sequencing is done for all amino technology. Uh, this video I recommend to everyone to watch if you're interested in seeing this in action. Uh, by the way, uh, there are a more advanced technology that rather than using four molecules, they could use a two molecules or single uh, picture technology. So this four picture technology, the, the things I was describing, there are two picture technology and one picture technology. So you really don't need to add uh, A, C, G, T. You can add, for example, A and C. And if there is no reaction, then I already know that it's not A, it's not C, or it's not the complement of these, but rather the other two options. So if you're interested, I can send you more materials on this to get more insights about. It. Now for the other company, which we call it Oxford Nanopore, it's totally different technology. So what we do, we do library preparation. We break up the DNA segment. We do exactly the same as olomina, but we break it as longer segments. So because the technology here can tolerate longer sequences, not as in there. Because here, when we wash the surface, when we do chemical reaction, this DNA strand will get weaker. So it doesn't matter if you make the segment or the fragment longer during the library preparation because it will be useless you'll get a lot of errors toward the end of the fragment. So that's why we try to exploit the entire DNA, break it into shorter, because we know that if you exceed this length, you will get sequencing errors anyway, so it will be useless. But here we will get sequencing error after longer distance of the DNA. So we break it into longer segment, and then we use what we call nanopore, which is a hole at nanoscale. And this hole will allow only the DNA strand to pass through, okay? And then we pass a current, electrical current through this hole and the electrical current passes through any base will get different in amplitude. So if you know the amplitude is this much ampere or milliampere, then it's going to be affected by the DNA because this is chemical a molecule and it will affect the ionic current passing through it. And then you observe the, the change in the current. You know what's going through the hole and what's coming out, and then you can measure it and you can observe these changes. So the nanopore is very small one, so you can measure the, the DNA or the change in current at very small scale because you don't want to get multiple bases affecting the current, but rather you want to get as low as possible, like single base affecting the current, so you can read the single character of that DNA. Uh, so yeah, these are the things I was explaining. So you measure the change in the phase or in the amplitude so that you can know what is the exact base over there. But as you see here, the change in the current sometimes can be random. It's really challenging. So the, the step that is we call base calling, it's very expensive compared to olamina. It can take 
really few days to be performed. That's why we normally use GPUs to accelerate it. But in Olamina, it's very fast. You just observe the light in the picture. If there is a light or a certain wavelength, then that is A or C or G or T. That's it, very cheap. You can do it in real time. But here is normally very expensive and we use machine learning to know if this change is coming from A or C or G. However, it can, the main benefits here is longer DNA segment. Again, there's a video here you can watch if you're interested to see this in action. However, regardless really the technique you are using, all of them, uh, they have something in common, which is give you pieces of your DNA, regardless if it's short or long. And we don't know anything about the order. We don't know if this DNA segment coming from this location or that location, all of them coming randomly from multiple locations. So as we discussed last time, you really need to solve it as a puzzle and then try to stitch these pieces together so that you can get the full picture. Now, the question remains uh, whether we wanna go for short reads or long reads. Of course, if you are solving puzzle, you're always looking for uh, larger pieces, right? That will make your job easier. So you can solve the puzzle uh, quickly. However, as you can see in this picture, the larger pieces in DNA does not necessarily to be easier because you will have more sequencing errors. So you might get the, the picture wrong at the end, as you can see the mouth over there and so on. And these are the main differences between the two techniques or two technologies. So we have high error rate can be up to 15%. Even until today, we have it up to 10%. Uh, we can still have very high error rate from this technology, but the other technology really very accurate, high throughput and cheap. However, it's just short. This is the main problem and depends on the application. We can choose either this or that or a combination of them. Sometimes for some studies, you can use both technologies to get two data sets and then use both of them for the same purpose. Now, recently we got a recent uh, new type of data that we call PacPio read, which is the company name PacPio. And they give you a type of read that we call high fi or high fidelity read. And this read is somewhere between the two techniques or the two technologies. So it is not as long as these reads, it's not reaching 2 million, something around 10 to 20,000 long, and it's very accurate. Uh, why it's accurate? So the, the, the sequencing is, let's say, similar to Olomina. It's similar to Olomina technique in the sequencing. However, the difference here is that we have the, the strand or the DNA fragments and its reverse complement attached to each other. We have also primer at the ends of the two segment and enzyme. So the, the, the primer over there will cause these two strands to be as a bell or as a circle, as you can see here. And then you can start the sequencing using some enzymes. And then the enzyme will give you wavelength or uh, light emitted whenever it can read these bases. So if it is A, it will give you a certain wavelength of light. If it is G, it will give you light and so on. And then you can take, not picture, but we take movie here. It's like a video, you record it up to 30 hours. Uh, of video, that really will be the output of the machine. And this video based on the light you observe or you measure, it will tell you what is the base. However, what they did here, they got subreads or subregions of this circle. And this subreads, they use at least 30 of them to build what we call consensus a sequence. Consensus sequence means you overlap these pieces, you know, all of them coming either from this strand or its reverse complement. Why reverse complement? As you can see here, if there is A here, we know that there is a T at the other side. That's why they bind together. If there is a G, then there is a C at the other side. If there is a C at this side, then there is a G at the other side and so on. So we know that this sequence has its reverse complement at the other side. And once we overlap all these sequences together, uh, we have very high confidence because every time the sequencing error is really random. So if you read the sequence again, the same sequence, if you read it again, then the error will not appear in the same location, as you can see here in the red dots. So they will appear at different locations, and then you can do majority voting uh, vertically. 
for example, at this column, how many C's I have. If I have majority as C, then probably the final result will be C in that location. So this way you can fix the errors. However, this process, we call it the CCS, which is circular consensus sequencing. It's really expensive. So only this part is done during the using the sequencing machine to produce the video. But then after the video, everything is computational. There is no chemical reaction and so on. So you only get the video, you uh, uh, convert the video into these subreads or sequences. And then you do the majority voting and the alignment over these using some existing methods or algorithms that are very expensive to perform. So this is how it, it became like it became really accurate in sequencing. The output of this uh, uh, technique uh, much accurate than ONT and longer than Olomida. That's the last technique we have widely used here. So these are three prominent techniques. There might be other uh, technologies coming from China, for example, and other countries, but these are still the three major technologies used currently worldwide and also in space in the International Space Station. So we observe that whenever we have a new technique, then most of the algorithms that used to process the data coming from that technology will get uh, outdated directly or irrelevant because the technology is different. And then you, you need to exploit some characteristics of these technologies to do the sequencing or the analysis uh, quickly and accurately. So whenever we have a new technologies directly, they dictate the algorithm and they have them as irrelevant. And this is what we observe in our recent work called Technology Dictates Algorithm. So I recommend you, if you're interested in this topic, to read uh, this paper. We uh, survey a, a large number of algorithms starting from 1988 all the way until uh, last year. So I recommend everyone to read it. We got a very good uh, positive feedback from the bioinformatics uh, community. Uh, so uh, we appreciate that. And now looking forward for the future of sequencing, will we be able to read the entire genome sequence as a single piece rather than fragmenting it into pieces? So that is still open question. And we may, as we move forward, we may get better technology, especially at very small scale that can read a single base uh, accurately if your DNA, you know that the single base in your DNA is really small. The entire DNA should fit single cell in your body. So you can imagine about how small the entire DNA, the 3 billion characters should be. So that's why we don't have any, um, we don't have any hardware that can go at the scale of single base and read it. And so that's why if we got something like that in the future, then we can think about having a very accurate or a sequencing machine that can read your full DNA as one piece. But even if we got such thing, I don't think the, the, the algorithms or the hardware accelerators that already exist from our group and from other research groups will be outdated. Why is that? Because we still have the same problem, how you compare a full genome to a full genome. If I wanna compare my full DNA to your full DNA, how I can do that? I will still read, need hardware accelerators that do the same job as if I'm comparing a single piece of your DNA to the full DNA uh, coming from different individuals. Also, when I compare bacteria to bacteria, viruses to viruses, all these questions should be solved by the same techniques used to solve the problem of mapping single read to the entire reference genome. That's all for today. Uh, we are on time. So um, yeah, if you have any question on YouTube or here, I can take them now. Otherwise, we are going to be offline now. So we can discuss the project assignments and uh, all these logistics. So we can start the projects directly from this week. Right. Can wait a few seconds. Okay, great. So we will keep meeting next week, same time for those on YouTube. Thank you so much for today and take care.